three minutes, just three minutes in trying to intensely learn this thing, even if I feel like I'm failing. But belief systems have a powerful role in how the tools and practices that we engage in shape us. How can people think about the best way they can learn? Terrific question. And fortunately, nowadays, we can look to studies done in humans that define some very key principles. The first principle is that the whole process of neuroplasticity and learning is really a two-stage process. First, there must be focus and alertness. That focus and alertness is associated with the release of neurochemicals, so-called neuromodulators, things like acetylcholine in particular, which sort of acts as a highlighter pen, if you will, for certain connections in the brain to later be reinforced. And the neurochemical adrenaline, which is also called epinephrine. Epinephrine, also called adrenaline, is associated with an increase in kind of agitation and alertness. Acetylcholine, think of it as kind of a spotlight or a highlighter pen for certain connections in the brain. So you need alertness and focus. And then the second stage is that it is only during periods of deep rest, in particular sleep and something that I call non-sleep deep rest, which I've given an acronym because scientists like acronyms, NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, things like yoga nidra, things like shallow naps, things like forms of meditation that don't involve a lot of uh, focused concentration. You're uh, far more the experienced uh, meditator than I, so I'm outside my wheelhouse when I'm talking about meditation. But it is only periods of intense focus and alertness followed by periods of deep rest that allow the nervous system to change. And there is an abundance of evidence for that. So that's the first thing to understand. The brain actually rewires during deep sleep and rest because during deep sleep and rest, naps, yoga nidra, deep sleep, there's a replay of the very same cells in the brain that were active during learning, oftentimes in reverse for reasons that are still not understood, but at a much higher repetition rate. So you're actually getting repetitions while you sleep. This is why one will strain to learn a language or a motor skill or maths or something like that over and over and over. It doesn't happen. You take a couple of nights sleep, take a break from it, and all of a sudden it's there. It's because it happens in rest. Now, there's some other things that one can do to enhance this process further that are arrived to us from good data. First of all, there's a so-called ultradian rhythm, which is the 90 minute cycles during which we can focus pretty well for a duration of about 90 minutes. Of course, flickering in and out of focus. Nobody really focuses for 90 minutes straight unless they've built up that capacity or they are very interested in what they're learning, <laughs> right? They're just wrapped with attention. Usually people flicker in and out. And of course, nowadays, there's a lot of literature and ideas about ways to maintain focus. Put the phone away, uh, limit noise. Some people like background noise. Some people like music. Some don't. It's very contextual, highly individualized. But 90 minutes is sort of the, the, the batch of time that the brain can focus really hard on one thing before it needs a true rest of, of an hour or two before you can go back to learning or working very hard. The other thing is that um, there's some very interesting data showing that Shallow naps or NSDR, non-sleep deep rest, done within four hours of one of these 90 minute learning bouts can be very beneficial for accelerating learning. And then there are these uh, incredible data on so-called gap effects. So there've been studies now of, of skills that are physical skills, mental skills, where people will, for instance, try to learn scales on the piano or a math problem or a spatial problem or a physical skill. And then at random, every so often, a buzzer will go off and the person will just be told to do nothing sit there eyes closed or eyes open and do nothing just stop the learning process for about 10 seconds and then return to doing what they're doing these are these little micro rests it turns out that during those micro rests the hippocampus a brain area as you know that's associated with learning and memory and the neocortex also associated with learning and memory undergoes replay of the thing that the individual is trying to learn at 20 times the speed also in reverse just as in sleep and that has, can lead and has been shown to lead to accelerations in learning. So there are these ways, I wouldn't even think of them as hacks because the word hack is a little tricky because it, when I think of the word hack, it seems like doing something with an object or a tool that wasn't designed for that purpose, right? Um, the nervous system already harbors these mechanisms and one can access them through these little micro rests. So whether or not you're a child or an adult, every so often when trying to learn something, just pause for 10 seconds or so, do your best to just clear your mind 
course, it's very hard to clear the mind, but um, do your best to clear the mind and then go back to the learning task as, as it were. And that has been shown to very to significantly accelerate the learning process and the retention of newly learned information. And then the last thing you touched on earlier, which is this notion of incremental learning. You said you like to throw yourself into something as kind of a litmus test of whether or not you enjoy it or not. Turns out that uh, from beautiful work done by my colleague at Stanford School of Medicine, Eric Knudsen, has shown that yes, it's true that early in development in humans, this would be up until the mid 20s, we can learn things in larger batches and much more easily than we can later in life. However, if one batches that work into smaller increments, and for, so for instance, deciding maybe set a timer, turning the phone off otherwise and saying, I'm gonna spend three minutes, just three minutes in trying to intensely learn this thing. Even if I feel like I'm failing, if one does that repeatedly, those little increments of learning can lead to an outsized amount of learning overall. And so the nervous system loves incremental learning. It loves to batch things into focused little bouts. And you know, if that's already the, the tools that you've built up, which it sounds like you have, wonderful. But if somebody is out there trying, you know, struggling to learn, really trying to break things down into very brief periods of intense focus, that is the cue by which during sleep, the nervous system will change itself. And this has been shown over and over and over again, even in very late life uh, individuals, people in their, you know, we like to think life could go on further than this, but people in their 80s and 90s still have neuroplasticity. There's even evidence that new neurons can be produced in the hippocampus of people in their late 80s and 90s. So the capacity is there. The belief that I hold very, uh, very close is that if you give people a little bit of an understanding of the underlying mechanisms. It creates a system around any tool that makes it easier to do that practice and uh, makes it more impactful as well. So what I mean is, you know, I could do a whole episode just listing off tools and protocols for everything from fat loss to focus and attention, mental health, depression, trauma, grief, et cetera, based on the data. But if I start each episode, which I do with a little bit of a, of a description of the mechanism. For instance, how cold impacts metabolism. How, for instance, a particular childhood attachment pattern to a parent translates to an adult romantic attachment pattern. Then when I go into some of the description about the tools, my hope is that people will have those mechanisms in mind or even just subconsciously they're embedded and then not only are they going to be more willing to lean into those tools, but those tools will be more impactful. You can't tell yourself that the entire chocolate cake is, you know, uh, just a, a bowl of broccoli and it's gonna have the same effects as a bowl of broccoli. So anything you do, whether or not it's exercise, cold bath, what you consume is the consequence of that thing. There's some undeniable, non-negotiable realities about your biology. And then there's the belief system. And the other example I'll give is, they've done these beautiful studies where they tell one group Listen, stress is a part of life and it gives you dementia. It makes your thinking suffer. It can kill neurons. It can do all this terrible stuff. They tell another group, all that's true by the way in certain contexts. They tell another group, stress is a part of life, but it can sharpen your thinking. It can bring out your best. It can stimulate your immune system as long as it doesn't last too long. And what they find is that the biological effects of stress on those two groups match what those people are taught about stress. Wow. And so you can't get around the realities of stress or, ca or calories or things of that sort. There's the laws of physics but, and the laws of biology, but belief systems have a powerful role in how the tools and practices that we engage in shape us. And so that's the, the logical backbone for teaching people a bit about the mechanism. Because if, if I say, hey, do an ice bath, you know, it increases your metabolism, increases your resilience and can reduce pain and inflammation, help you sleep better at night. Great, but lots of people are saying that. But if I say, listen, there's this pathway where when you get into cold water and it, it's really uncomfortable and you really wanna get out, but you stay in for an extra minute, you stimulate this certain uh, adrenaline related pathway in your brain and body. Now, when you do it and you hit that wall, you're like, I really wanna get out of here. You think, no, I wanna stimulate that pathway. And then your belief and understanding about that pathway really does shape the fact that it works. Uh, and so teaching mechanism is in part for me about educating and turning people on to the beauty of biology. But I realize, look, not everyone wants to be a biologist or a researcher, but I think everybody wants better mental health, physical health and performance. And so mechanism has a real impact.